Thanks to Mother Kojiro, Zyrule, and Brian Finley for suggesting the games for this week's episode. In the late 80s and early 90s, Kimco ported a series of point-and-click adventure games to the NES, Shadowgate, Deja Vu, and The Uninvited. These games were originally released on computer by ICOM Simulations, although Kimco handled the NES ports. I've covered the McVenture series on the NES fairly extensively elsewhere on the channel, so I won't say too much else about it here, but if you haven't seen those episodes, I'll put a link in the description. Kimco decided to try their hand at creating their own port and click adventure game from scratch rather than simply doing a port of another computer game and that leads us to Sword of Hope released on the Game Boy in 1989. What do you get when you cross Shadowgate and Dragon Warrior? You get Sword of Hope on Game Boy. Even though Sword of Hope is not a direct sequel to Shadowgate, it absolutely feels like it exists in the same universe. However, what makes Sword of Hope unique to the McVenture style of gameplay is that it also adds RPG elements such as random monster encounters, leveling up your character, and finding health potions and attack spells. On paper, that sounds absolutely amazing. In practice, well... Huh. Okay, so the story here is that long ago in the country of Rykar, there was this evil dragon that was imprisoned. The Sword of Hope was thrust into a painting of the dragon, which kept him prisoner in some sort of curse. However, the dragon was able to telekinetically haunt Rykar's king and essentially lure him to the dark side. The king removed the Sword of Hope from the painting under command from the dragon, thus freeing the dragon. Then the dragon summoned an evil god who turned everybody in Rykar into trees. <laughs> Holy crap! So that's where you come in, Prince Theo, son of King Hennessy. There was a prophecy that foretold Theo would be the one to put a stop to all this, so the possessed king tried to murder Theo as a small child. Then this dude Pascal rescued Theo, and they've been living and hiding in the woods ever since. Now that Theo is old enough, he's ready to set off to try to find the Sword of Hope and end all of this darkness once and for all. You take over as Theo, and the game starts off with Pascal, now an old man, giving you some information and a few helpful items, and then you're off on your quest. Gameplay functions similar to the McVenture series, but with a more streamlined interface. Several of the commands have been removed to keep things a bit more straightforward, but this should look familiar to Shadowgate fans. You've got your nav panel, some commands, and then a window showing you a first-person perspective of your view. Boy, that, uh, that view is pretty small. This is perfectly playable on a large monitor, but I can only imagine how many little kids went blind looking at that tiny view on the already minuscule Game Boy screen. Thankfully, with the commands, you don't have to squint to see some pixel-sized secret door in the background or something. Just clicking on the command brings up whatever objects are in the area that you can interact with in the menu, so that's helpful. And navigating through the area is pretty easy with the nav panel in the corner. The adventure gaming elements are straightforward here. Try to examine everything in the area, use items if you've got them to see if you can interact with anything, and see if something happens. You've usually got to solve some sort of puzzle to move on to the next part of the game. There's also other people you can talk to who apparently didn't get turned into trees, such as shopkeepers. You can also talk to the trees, since they're technically former residents of the country. Sometimes they give you clues, or something important might happen. Now, I mentioned this game has RPG elements, and that's... how should I put this nicely? That may make the game less accessible to some people just seeking a casual adventure gaming experience. Alright. The random monster encounters are craked up full blast. This is straightforward turn-based RPG stuff, but it just never ends. There are little dots on the navigation panel letting you know if there's a monster in that direction, but I don't even know why they bothered because monsters randomly show up whether there's dots or not. Sometimes another one will spawn in right after you just killed the first monster. Hell, sometimes monsters would literally spawn into the area while I was just futzing through the commands in the menu. What the? I, I was just standing still. <laughs> I swear, they never stop. In Final Fantasy, you could usually at least take four or five steps before you get hit with another random encounter, but this is totally relentless. Your character does at least level up at a fairly decent rate, and you also gain new attack spells as you progress, although the enemies do seem to keep up with you in terms of leveling throughout the game. The old man teaches you a teleport spell at the beginning, so you can use that to go see this shaman if you get too beat up. He's the equivalent of staying at an inn, and charges you gold to completely replenish your health and magic. Or you can buy items such as wheat and herbs, which basically function as potions. And if you die, the game just teleports you back to the old man and he revives you, so it's pretty forgiving in that regard. If you visit the shaman and look into the crystal ball, the game gives you a password so that you can pick up where you left off too, so that's helpful. 
My only complaint about all this is that with all the random monster encounters, it can make it incredibly frustrating just to even keep track of where you are or what you're doing, especially since a lot of the areas look similar. You'll need to write down a map for yourself on a piece of paper and really keep track of where you are. It's easy to get disoriented with all the random encounters, especially since sometimes they're even kind of long. So yeah, point and click adventure game meets RPG. On paper, it sounded really cool. In practice, I don't believe it's going to translate to fun for everybody. So after a while, it just gets to be a tedious numbers game. You're sitting there smashing A, are you going to have enough hit points or power ups to make it to your next objective before you die or have to teleport back to the shaman and get topped off? Now, to be fair, I'm looking at this through the lens of a middle-aged dad with six-month-old twins. I don't really have time anymore to sit here and level up a character for three hours. That's why you don't see many straight RPGs covered here on the channel. They just take too long to record the footage. Don't get me wrong, I absolutely loved them as a kid. Final Fantasy games were always a must-buy for me on day one. Well, up until part 13 anyway. Hey, let's make a game where you just run down a hallway for 18 hours. That'll be fun. So yeah, sort of hope. As a kid, I totally would have devoured a game like this. I, I mean, I would have loved it. I would have totally sank a whole bunch of time into this, and I, I loved Shadowgate and all that stuff. I, I would have thought this was a ton of fun to play. As a grown man, eh, it's a little bit harder to recommend. If you're a fan of the McVenture games, and particularly Shadowgate, all I can say is try it out for yourself. You might like it a lot. And if you like it, they made a sequel a few years later, Sort of Hope 2. I was hoping they had improved on the timing of the monster encounters of the first one, but nope, it was exactly the same. They did make the view screen a little bigger though, and you even get some really cool looking cutscenes. Okay, that was all the bad stuff, but one thing that makes these games at least worth trying is the music. The Kimco NES games, and specifically the McVenture games, always had their own unique sound to them. There's nothing else on the NES that sounded quite like it. Frankly, to me, that makes the NES versions of the McVenture games the definitive ways to play those games just because of the music. As soon as I fired up Sword of Hope, right from the title screen, the music took me back to the land of Shadowgate. Like I said, it's not an official sequel, but it feels like it's in some sort of shared McVenture cinematic universe. Every track in these two games feels like a B-side to the original and superb Shadowgate. Shadowgate soundtrack. The music is just really damn good. So yeah, like I said, these games are worth trying just for the music, but if you're not already a fan of McVenture games or don't have the time to sit there and grind up your character in an old school turn-based RPG with random monster encounters, these games probably won't work for you. Well, what did you think? Did you play Sword of Hope 1 or 2 on the Game Boy? What are some other games in the point-and-click genre that you would like to see me cover here on the channel at some point? Or what are some other Game Boy games you'd like to see me take a look at? As always, thank you for watching. Please don't text and drive, and I'll see you next time on Friday Night Arcade.